Hi, I'm Paul Brody. We're back in my shop. It's good to be here. Thank you for coming along. Mitch is behind the camera. Thank you, Mitch. My leg is still healing up, so we're not going to be working on that CR750. There's been a little bit of interest in that bike, and we will get to it. I need to mount the front fender on it. The front fender mount got lost. Today we're going to do the true story of Brody Bikes. I ran a bicycle business for many, many years, and this is a bit of a photo essay on it with some commentary and some stories. Hope you enjoy it. So we're going to go back. We're going to go back to when I was 12 years old. I was already making things out of metal. There was a, a mini bike craze throughout North America. Popular Science had articles on them. Motorcycle shops were selling them. And the most popular one in my area anyway, Western BC, Vancouver, you could buy a Bonanza mini bike for $149. It was red. It had a Briggs & Stratton motor. A lot of the kids, their fathers are buying them. My father was not going to buy me a mini bike for $149. So I heard about a frame for sale and I thought, wow, 35 bucks for a frame. And I went and looked at it and it was a piece of junk. And as I walked home, I decided at 12 years old that I was going to build my own mini bike. It cost me $85 to build. I never kept a track of my labor. It's a, a Clinton motor, a 2.5 horsepower out of a, a lawnmower. Uh, the wheels are off a wheelbarrow, I presume. I didn't quite know how to weld then. I was just getting into grade eight, so I had some help with the welding. And then I did weld some parts of it myself. So that is my little mini bike. About a year after that, it was my birthday. We went down to Jericho Beach. That's next to the ocean in Vancouver. and. We spent the whole day down there. I had a friend on a little Honda Mini Trail and we rode all day. The cops never came. You can't do that anymore. That was a fun day. When I was 17 years old, it was the early 1970s and it was the 10 speed craze. I don't know if you recall that. Everybody wanted a 10 speed. The motorcycle shops were, telling, were selling 10 speeds. They couldn't keep them in stock. They had three people, the local shop, had three guys, all they did was to build 10 speeds on the floor next to the motorcycles. And as soon as the bike got sold, out the door. So I wasn't going to buy a new bike. I didn't have much money. So I scrounged parts. I got a frame off a friend. And I was out there. I've got sneakers on. I don't even have proper shorts. Don't even have sleeves. I do have a leather helmet, which was pretty cool at the time. So I did enter a few races looking like that. I never rode with anybody because I didn't know anybody that also had a 10 speed. I got cut off shorts. I mean, now that would be just awful. And I got my sneakers. That's also awful because you don't have the cleat. You don't have the hard sole. I was learning, I was reading books and that was my, my dabble into 10 speed racing. I wasn't gonna show this, but Mitch had his finger pointing up on the shelf and this is the trophy that I won. I was 17 and it was the trophy, it was the Peddler Trophy Race. That's the store that I ended up working for. That's the next part of the story. And there was a sprint in the novice class and I don't know how it happened. Somehow I was first. And so that's the only trophy I ever won road racing. So a memento from the past. After I left high school, I thought I'd take it easy for a couple of weeks and that didn't work out at all. I was coming back from downtown Vancouver and there was a machine shop. I had an interest in machine shop. So I walked into the store and said that I was looking for a job and they asked me some questions and took my phone number and then they phoned me the next day and wanted me to come down and talk some more. So that was, it was a shop called Cylinder Grinders. And so that's where I ended up working for three weeks, three weeks, three years. So here's a picture of the shop and this is the side that I worked on. They had two different sides. This is the automotive side. I did the valve jobs, the rebores, the cylinder honing, and all things like that. So here's a couple guys looking down a barrel intently. That's my boss, Ed. That's my foreman, John. We did not always get along so well, but 
I picked up a lot of things in that shop, learning how to do things. So, and there was a second side to the shop, which I ended up graduating over to. And that was more of the machine shop side. And it was a jobbing shop, so you never really knew what was coming in the door. So here it is with all the lathes and uh, in the mills, and there was a, a cylindrical grinding machine, internal cylindrical grinding. That's where I ended up working for six months next to a guy that, Fred, who had worked there for 42 years. And he says to me, he says, are you going to work here 42 years? And I said, I don't think so, Fred. So anyway, three years spent in this shop. That was overall, it was a good experience, even though sometimes I didn't like it at the time. I drove cab from 79 to 73. I had a saxophone teacher. I thought that I was gonna be in a band. It was, uh, well, it was, it was a dream. It was a fantasy. I was never good at playing saxophone. But anyway, he drove cab and he convinced me that when you drive cab three days a week, it gives you four days off and you can do whatever you want. And that kind of appealed to me. So I signed up to be a cab driver and that's what I did. What I found is that very hard to get out of cab driver when you like that lifestyle. So I tried a few things and I'll show you a couple of the things that I tried. I was a little bit of an artist, so I came up with a figure called Wilbur, and Wilbur was the cartoon character in a cab driving series, and I worked on that for quite a while. Obviously, it never went anywhere, but I tried something. I put an effort in. I even got a copyright on it. How silly. But anyway, I did it. So when Wilbur didn't work out, <clears throat> I turned my attention other places. So the next thing I did, I did a set of four motorcycle road racer Indian art motorcycle prints. And I really thought that I was on my way here. I was going to make some bucks. Because, you know, when you get four sets made, if you can sell them for 20 bucks and you got 400, 500 sets, what is that, $10,000 more? I don't know. You can do the math. Anyway, so I tried to sell them and there really wasn't much interest because open up a magazine, you got a full, a full color photo of action shop motorcycle. Who wants to pay money and then have to buy a frame to put it on the wall? So I sold a few, not many. And then over the next probably 17 years that passed by, I gave them away. And that was even kind of hard to give them away. People would say, well, I'll take that one. I, I don't want that one. So learn, learning my lesson on, on being an entrepreneur in the art world didn't always work out. But I was still looking for a way out of cab driving. I decided at this point in life, this was about October of 82, I decided that I hadn't had a bicycle for a while. And I, I thought I needed a bicycle. That would be good for exercise and I could get around on it. So I went down to my local bike shop, which was the peddler, and I walked in, and I was just looking, right? I was looking. And then an hour later, I walked out with a, Nor a brand new Norco Magnum 12-speed road bike, which I had no intentions of buying that. And I spent $386 on my visa that I had not intended to spend. So I go home with this bike and I start to ride it. And I, I realized pretty quick that it's not the greatest bike that you can buy, but I had a bike. So I needed some parts. So I went back to the shop and I walked in with the bike and Sam's leaving. Sam's the owner and he says, oh, you buying parts? I said, yeah. So he says, good. So I, I go to the counter and I wait for probably 10 minutes. Nobody comes to the counter. And so then I, I leave because I'm not going to stand there forever. And then as I walk out the door, Sam's walking in. He's got his coffee and he wants to know if I got what I want. And I said, no. I said, Sam, you really need to hire somebody. This is terrible. Come on in, he said. So I got myself my first job working in a bicycle shop. And my job was to assemble Apollo Sport 10s, the all-steel bicycle that sold for 
I don't know, I'm guessing $179. They were pretty terrible bikes. So anyway, I lasted three days. And on the third day, my hands got all greasy. And I was making five bucks an hour, which was basically the same as cab driving. So it was, it was kind of a wash. Right next to the assembly area, there was the office. And that's where Sam and Dave was. And they were, they were in a big argument. They needed some artwork for an ad the very next day they had known about it for six months neither of them had done anything and now this was crunch time and i could hear all this going on because the door was wide open they weren't trying to hide this argument conversation so i poke my head in the door and i say excuse me and they look up and i say i can do that ad for you and they were kind of incredulous, not really knowing what to say. But I said, you know, I've done some artwork. So I did. I went down to the local art shop. I think it was Benson's on Robson Street, if you know the area. I bought Letra set. I made up a little cartoon man, a guy riding a bicycle, and he had an umbrella. And I did the little ad thing. It took me eight hours, so I made 84 to... Oh, oh I was... I was going to get paid $8 an hour for this, so I made $64 for my work. They got their ad out in time, and then after that, I never had to assemble anymore. I didn't assemble anymore, but I moved into a position where I would work on the sales counters, and I would sell kids' bikes. I didn't know much about bicycles, but I could handle those I'll call them minor roles. And when someone wanted something at the till, it was not computer. You didn't do a scan. There was a price label on the part. And if it said $5, I'd say to them, how about if I charge you $4? And they'd always say less because I like to deal when I went shopping. So I gave everybody a deal. And Sam never said a word. I don't think he ever knew about that. So that lasted for a few months. And then... One day after work, me and Dave, Dave was the manager, we got into this great conversation all about frame design, sloping top tubes, and 24-inch wheels. We talked for three quarters of an hour, and I went home that evening feeling really up about the bicycle world and frame design and all that. Next morning, I go into work. Dave is not there. Sam's there. Sam says, what are you doing? I said, I, I showed up for work. And he says, well, didn't Dave tell you? I said, tell me what? And he says, that you laid off. And that was a complete shock to me. I never saw it coming. I was devastated. I walk home slowly. And if there's one thing I decided on that walk home is that I'm never going to work for anybody else in my entire life. So... I didn't have a job at the Peddler Bicycle Shop, but they needed me. They needed me to do all sorts of renovations and things like that. So I'm going to run through a little itinerary here of things that I was doing while not working for them and getting eight bucks an hour still. I made a sandwich board for the Peddler Bicycle Shop. They would later change their name to Bob's Bikes on Broadway, but for the first part, it was the Peddler. I made sales counters. There was no one else they knew who could make sales counters, so I was using my woodwork skills. And there's some other sales counters or places you could put your coffee. This is the back of the sales counter, and this is where all the inner tubes went. They wanted it on an angle so that the inner tubes would always slide down to the bottom and look more, more organized that, and then other stuff went over here. And this is where extra clothing went, and they did put a bicycle up on top to show what was going on there. I made some racks for a bunch of, of, of cycling clothing, so you can see what I did. There's a rim, 10-speed handlebars, a tube, and then there was a little spike that came out, and that's where the wheel, wheel went on, because it's a quick release wheel and then you could you could actually lock it and then all the hangers holding the clothing went all around here and you could spin it too. Now in this store it's a good thing to mention at this time because 
because the peddler was a huge store and, and, and they just weren't using all their space. And so they had space that they could rent and the renter upstairs was Rocky Mountain bicycles in its infancy. They were very small in a way, but they had lots of amb ambitions. So what they were doing was ordering things out of Italy. They were or ordering clothing. They were ordering uh, a Gucci frame sets, and and they were selling them. But they were upstairs. They never really had a good storefront. But as they got into the frames more, they got a wheel building operation that was known as Wheel Tech, and these guys were lacing the wheels up in their laps. So what they wanted was a rack, a fixture to hold the rim and the spokes and so they could lace it up where the rim and the spoke and the rim and the hub was held in position. So I want to show you how this works here. I built them three racks. There's the post where the hub mounts on. This holder over here is to hold, hold the nipples and then over here there's a series of rollers and it's adjustable for, for, uh, for different sizes of rims. You can move this up and down on the post here. These are wheels off a, a skateboard. Here's the close up. This is a piece of 3 16 spring steel rod and you can see how you pull this up and it glides over, snaps in. So it's locked. So, so the rim is coming through here it's all adjustable and, and, and they actually worked quite well. I never, never got any sort of, of, of bad news over that. And I had to get these done because I had a mortgage payment coming up. And if I didn't figure out how to do this, I wouldn't be able to make the mortgage payment. So this was really crunch time for me back in, well, I guess it was 82, somewhere right around there. As I mentioned earlier, Rocky, Rocky Mountain uh, had an entrance off the alleyway. There was no entrance off of, off of Broadway Street. So they wanted me to make a sign for the door so that when someone came around to the alley, parked in the alley parking lot, they knew where Rocky Mountain was. So this is the sign that I came up with. And that got mounted on their old door. Inside the Rocky Mountain warehouse, there's some frame boxes and they needed a set of steps taking them for the, from the main floor up to the upstairs where they had more of the storage. So I made a set of steps, eight bucks an hour. And you carpenters, you can probably pick faults with all that. So that was basically what I did working at Rocky, well, working at the Peddler and getting more involved with Rocky Mountain because the owners of Rocky Mountain, everybody wanted you to think that retail was separate from wholesale, but that's not actually what happened. There was a lot of overlap between the owners of retail and wholesale. That's another story. Not really going to go into that. I'm working in this situation of some people I'm working with are in retail, some are in wholesale. There's kind of a flow going. Everybody kind of knows what's going on. And, and that's when the Red Ritchie showed up. And for me, that changed an awful lot. I'm going to show you the picture. Here's the Red Ritchie that showed up. This probably would have been in late, late 82 or late, late 83. See, because the mountain biking scene it started in, in California earlier, probably four or five years earlier. And it took a while for the mountain bike craze or whatever you want to call it to make its way up the coast. And then from when it hit the Vancouver area, that became a big spot for the mountain biking. And then it slowly spread east. It didn't just start in California and then suddenly it was everywhere in North America. It didn't happen like that. It, it slowly took its time as it went from shop to shop, region to region. That's more how it happened. So anyway, this is a bike that was made, made by Tom Ritchie, the man himself. 
And I could not believe that anybody had made a bike that beautiful. I just, I couldn't take my eyes off it. So I wanted one. I could not afford a bike like that, but I knew that in the back of the peddler, there was a dumpster and we didn't recycle like we do now. Everything went in that dumpster, the garbage, the frames, the parts, everything went in there. So at lunchtime, that's the first thing I did. I went into the dumpster and I looked for what I could find. And I found a Sakeen road bike, a 25 inch road bike that was way too big for me. Well, I guess I could have made it work, but that's not what I wanted. I wanted the tubing. I wanted the bottom bracket and things like that. So I grabbed that and I took it home to my shop because I, I had a, a working shop now at the back of my house. I'll show you what I came up with. Here's the bike that I am building. And I've made a set of forks. They're just made out of my mild steel tubing, nothing fancy. I made up a jig out of, out of plywood and two by fours to hold the jigs. And I didn't have a TIG welder, so I had the brazing torch. And by the time I had tacked the forks, the jig was on fire and I had to take the whole thing outside and it burnt. That was a jig that got used once. And so I, I cut out the top tube. You can see the braze. I lowered the top tube down so I had a sloping top tube. That was my goal. I wanted to do a bike like Tom's. That was a Timberline comp, I think. No, uh, yeah, it was some kind of a comp. I think maybe a Timberline comp. I can't remember now. And anyway, so I I worked on this thing and I've been assembling parts. I would scrounge parts because the bike shop had a lot of parts on the benches and found a set of wheels and tires. I was on my, I was so psyched by building this bike. It was just, it was kind of amazing. Here's what the bike looks like when I've, I've done all the brazing and I, I got a couple tubes as chainstays. These are mild steel. I, I was really in my infancy of learning about, about bicycles. I didn't know about uh, a geometry and angles and lengths. I was winging it. So you can see the fork and there was a big lumpy steps here. So what I ended up doing was smoothing it with Bondo and then after it got blasted, of course, I painted it red so that the bike would kind of look like Tom's. So I have painted the bike. And when you look at it, it kind of says mountain bike. But if you know anything about bikes at all, can you see the angle of the chain stays? The bottom bracket is really slow, really, well, slow, low. Maybe that's the same good same word. The bottom bracket is really low. I think it's... Uh, at 10 inches. I don't think it's under 10, but it's basically around 10 inches. So I put on, I scrounged some 165 cranks and then I had to be really careful going around corners because otherwise the pedal was, would hit. I actually used to stop pedaling in the corners and the head angle is kind of steep. And I think maybe because of the toe overlap, I have to be really careful that my toe doesn't hit onto the tire. I got a brook saddle. It ended up sagging a lot. It wasn't great. The forks were okay. I got cantilever brakes front and back. My first mountain bike, and I think, a, I think some people at Rocky Mountain kind of opened their eyes a bit and realized that, huh, maybe this kid can do something. Well, I wasn't a real kid then, but maybe he thought this young guy could maybe do something with his hands and working with metal. I could do small wheelies on the bike because you notice how, how dark my hair is? I was younger. Life was full of potential back then. Okay, right back in town at the bike shop with, with the peddler. And there was also Rocky Mountain renting space upstairs. There were some pretty big things happening. Uh, like I said, Rocky was am ambitious. So in, in town here in in Vancouver, there was also a bicycle frame shop called Norman Hill. Norman Hill was a total character, and he came over from Eng England. He had his background in bicycles in England, opened up a real retail shop down by uh, Stanley Park. 
and he decided that he wanted a frame shop. So he set himself up a frame shop in Steveston, which is in Richmond. He hired a guy from England, brought him over. That was Derek Bailey. He becomes integral in the story starting from this point. So Norman Hill ran the bicycle shop in the daytime. He, I guess he built the wheels, he did the sales. And then he was also a spray painter. So after the shop closed at six o'clock, he would drive out to Steveston, which was about an hour, and he would paint frames. And these were all road bike and track frames, which were made by Derek Bailey. Those were his specialties. He had no interest in mountain bikes whatsoever. So these frames were painted often fluorescent orange and driving around town, nobody else had bikes painted in the, late 70s, early 80s, fluorescent orange. The bikes really made a statement. Anyway, he wasn't making it financially. Funny that it's so hard to make money in the bicycle business financially. So he sold. He sold the frame shop to Rocky Mountain. So now Rocky Mountain had a frame shop. They had a frame builder. That was Derek Bailey. And they didn't have a, have a spray painter because Norman Hill was no longer in the picture. So I was the handyman, remember, eight bucks an hour. And so they, they asked me, they said, would you spray paint, spray paint frames? And I said, well, I have no experience spray painting frames. And they said, we don't know anybody else who can spray paint frames. So I had an old Econoline van at the time, it was a 1964. It was painted uh, red oxide primer. And so I would drive out there in, in Grandma. The, the van was nicknamed Grandma. And I got a key to the shop and I learned how to spray paint frames. Nobody showed me, there was nobody to show me. I was basically self-taught. And so they seemed to like how I spray painted frames. So I became the painter. And so I was working out there with, with Derek Bailey, this eccentric Englishman who I found that sometimes we got along with or not. And I realized I sensed an opportunity because back in town at the bicycle shop, there was mountain bikes. They were starting to get mountain bikes on the sales floor. The first specialized stump jumper it showed up, $750, and I rode that, and it was okay, but didn't knock my socks off or anything, but I sensed that there was an opportunity. So I, I asked for a meeting with Rocky, the Rocky bosses, and I said, why don't you let me make frames for Rocky out at what was known then as Sherpa Manufacturing? And they were skeptical. They were really skeptical, but... There was nobody else knocking on their door in that, in that fashion. So they gave me 10 sets of tubing and I went home and I literally sat on my couch for a week. And I thought uh, at that time, uh, uh, Tom Ritchie was a huge influence in the shop. I was paint, I had started painting his frames. You know, they made a deal where they could get raw Ritchie frames up and then I would paint. And so I saw a lot of Ritchie stuff all around me. And I knew that Tom was big in California. And so what went through my mind was when I was, I was solving a problem, how to build a frame, how would Tom do this? It was always, how would Tom do this? So anyway, I went out to the shop and gonna show you a picture of Derek Bailey. Here is Derek Bailey, and he had some decals. Oh, oh, they made decals for him, so I put a decal on it. So we'd always know who he was. So he was an eccentric Englishman. He learned his frame building trade in England, working for various cycle shops and manufacturers over there. And so he's he could be a little bit negative, but we like to play rock, rock trivia. And sometimes we had a lot of fun. The first thing he told me was, I'm not going to show you anything. So I knew that right away he was not going to be any sort of a mentor at all. He had his workbench. I had my workbench in behind. So I watched him. I watched everything he did. I copied all his good habits, 
and I copied all his bad habits. And then years later, when I realized what the good and the bad was, I had to unlearn the bad habits. But, c'est la vie, that's, that's how it was. I'm going to show you a few photos of the Rocky shop so that, that you can know the kind of environment that I was working in there. What you must realize, even though I said when I got laid off that I would never work for anybody else again, I really had to think about this. And I realized that I was taking a job, but I also realized that it was a real opportunity because I couldn't learn this kind of stuff working for anybody else at that time anyway. And so I kind of humbled up, I guess you would say, and I took on the job knowing that it was a great opportunity and I would learn a lot. So that was, that was my thinking back then. I am upstairs in the Rocky shop. I'm on the mezzanine. I can't remember what went on up there. Maybe that was a lunchroom and I'm looking down. So this is the common table that got shared. Look at the junk. This is my, my little piece, my, my workbench. And Derek worked over here on his bench. Here's my frame jig that I made. Not a great frame jig, but that's all I had. And there's, there's a bead blaster and the paint booth was over this side. In a bicycle shop or a frame building shop, a campy toolkit is, you know, something that's, it's very valuable. It costs a couple grand anyway and back then and uh, it needs to be well treated. Well, did not get well treated in the Rocky shop. This is the first frame jig I ever made and my next frame jigs looked a lot different. I learned a lot making this frame jig. So you can see I got about seven frames waiting down here. So I'm in a batch. Notice how the frames aren't all the same size. So in the frame orders, they got mixed up different sizes. That's okay. Another view of a rocky workbench needs to be cleaned up for sure. There was just not a lot of emphasis on cleaning up. I was under pressure. Rocky wanted that first frame and the weeks were going by and I was finding that I was making my, my frame jigs and my fixtures and it was just taking a long time and I kept getting a phone call. When are we gonna get frame number one? We're really interested to see frame number one. So this is a shot of frame builder one to one. As a frame builder, maybe things have changed now because components have changed. But back in those days, where you had a cable operated rear brake, there was much more <clears throat> of a opportunity to make this your signature part of the frame. And so this is what I call, what I was, I was searching for, is I, I, I was trying to come up with my own style for the signature of the frame. And you can see how I've done some fancy, I call it fancy shit. So there's a, a cable hanger here, it's, it's 3D. I've gone, I've gone bilaminate, copying Richie, putting on the lug, that's a lot of work. This became overcomplicated and it's too busy, but I'm learning my own style. It takes a long time to, for a frame builder to learn their own style. In my backyard with my, my Tom Ritchie style brazing, brazing glasses. So horizontal top tube, everything is pretty conventional, big heavy fork crown, but it's a bike. I took it down to Rocky right after this and I took it in and I, I, talk, I talked to Grayson. He could not believe that I had made a bike and I'm thinking, well, what, it, what were you thinking? You gave me a set of tubing and you, you're paying me eight bucks an hour and I got to come up with something. And it just kind of really impressed him, let's say. And so right away he's talking, oh, we got to make more frames here. I'm going to write you out an order for another nine frames because I got 10 sets of tubing. I built one. So the out, so the uh, overflow number was nine. So I came away from that feeling pretty good because I knew that things were heading in a direction. So I did the ob obligatory road test, the wheelie down the alley, and then it was back out to the shop and building more frames.
working in the Rocky Frame Shop, which was called Sherpa Manufacturing, I'd built approximately 30 frames now, and I had an idea for a sloping top tube frame. So I went and had a meeting with uh, Upper Upper Rocky Mountain. I talked to uh, Jacob, who was also known as as Jake the Snake. I have no idea why anyone would ever call him that. So anyway, I told him, I said, you know, I've got an idea for a, a sloping top tube frame that you might be interested in. You and Rocky might be interested. And uh, what do you think? He says, well, how much do you want? How much do you want for your design? And me being well, let's say I was young and, and naive and I had no sense of learning how to make a deal, entrepreneurship, and I said, a set of tubing? Because I was thinking, I'm going to build myself another bike. Well, back in those days, you could buy a set of tubing for 30 of, and, and, and this is tangy tubing we're talking to with bottom brackets and brazons and all that. Rocky would sell me a set like that for $35. Now, if I buy one tube, <clears throat> that's basically $35. So me, I said, uh, yeah, that sounds fine to me. So we did a deal right there. They get my frame design and I get basically $35. Way to go, Paul. So anyway, you can see here how, how, how this uh, design worked. It was Columbus SP tubing. There was a seat tube extension made out of Chrome Molly 4130. And I had the seat stays mounted on the side. We got the Sun to a power cam brake under the seat stays. What that means is that the cable had to come through and the cable was internal inside, inside the top tube. I had my own logo that I was allowed to use on these frames now. I had to run that by Rocky. So the cable ran through. That means that this frame, frame design had a compromise. The seat tube could only go down to as far as the cable, which was okay, because, but that was a bit of a compromise. That got changed later. So this was my frame design. So I made my own frame using this design. And I think my frame was number 32, so I'm slowly, incrementally getting more. Okay, so you have to appreciate what's going on. I'm working inside Rocky. I'm building Rocky frames, but I've got my own bike, which I've built. And there's the Brody decal on it, right in front of everybody. So, but no one really said anything. So we just carried on. But that's the bike I was riding. And it was made out of Columbus SB tubing. That bike was beautiful to ride. It had a Ritchie Unicrown fork on it. Here's me on the same bike. I was now racing my mountain bikes. This was called, it was called the Burnaby Flatlands Race. It was put on by Synchro, which was Peter and, and Pippin at the time. And there was no hills. You just race around, around the four corners of a, a flat field in the mud. But it was a nice day, it was kind of fun, and they gave away some prizes and early mountain bike racing in, in the lower mainland here. So I was working in a frame shop. I was working for Rocky Mountain. Mountain bike racing was in its infancy, but it was, it was picking up. It was a very exciting time. Lots of people were keen on mountain biking, and I was in the midst of it, to be sure. I left Rocky in May of 86, so now I, I was truly on my own. So this, I want to show you this. This is the house that I, I lived in my, with my sister. We had a mortgage on this. This was on, in the east end of, of Vancouver, and I knew that I wanted my own shop. So in the, in the years leading up to this, I built this extension. This is a sun deck, and my workshop is underneath. I was always short of money, so I didn't have a, a doorway here, didn't have sliding glass, French doors. When you wanted to go out onto the patio, you climbed out the window. I didn't have any railings going around here. I didn't even have a railing for the steps going down. I only barely got the siding on, but the workshop was underneath. I'll show you what that looks like.
This is inside my small shop. I still have, out of interest, if you're, if you're interested, I still have that red stool. I have my bandsaw, I have my toolbox, I have my park stand, I have my frame jig. So a lot of that stuff, all those years ago, I am still using. So this is where we would build the frames and it wasn't long before Mike Trulove, he came over and he wanted to work for me. So we, we worked together for I think eight years. When I was leaving Rocky Mountain, I knew a guy there. We, we, let's say we got to know each other. Whether we were friends, that is debatable. Well, not friends anymore. So his name was Michael. We're not using last names here. And he worked in the sales department and he was a very good salesperson. He also worked at the Peddler. He liked to smoke a little bit, but whatever. And uh, so we made a deal. We would both leave Rocky Mountain at the same time. I would make the frames, he would sell the frames. His idea was to get the bike shops interested so that the rider would go to the bike shop, bike shop would order the frame off him. He had placed the order with me. Everybody, it works right down through the line. But the problem was that nobody knew Paul Brody. Who the heck was Paul Brody? So there was some racers who knew who I was and they wanted to buy frames off me, but he didn't want to sell them frames. He wanted them to go through the bike shop connection. And that wasn't happening. Anyway, he shows up at my door one day. He phones me in advance and says, He's going on a sales trip to the Okanagan. He wants three frames and he's going to write me out a check for $1,000. Being self-employed, this was my very first paycheck. And I thought, great, get a check. So he shows up and he's, he's all bubbly. He's enthused. He's got his Volkswagen van, of course. He loads up the three frames, couple forks, and he's off for the Okanagan. And I, I deposit my 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 check for a thousand dollars into the bank and I withdraw I don't know a few bucks a hundred bucks and then a couple days later I go back to the bank and I want to take out another little bit of money and the bank's not letting me have money it's saying there's a problem and he phones a little bit later and he says I he wants the deal to go back to how it was where we sell to we sell to stores, but there were no stores that were ever knocking on my door or phoning up. And so that wasn't working. And I said, no, we, we need to sell to races. So that was obviously a bone of contention. He wasn't going to make good on the check. I wasn't going to give him any more frames. So that was kind of a done deal. So here it is. Here is the stop payment check that I still have. I save all this stuff. Why I do, I don't know. Anyway, my first check being in business, self-employed in the bicycle industry, and I get stiffed. Great way to start a business. So I was still building frames in my shop. I'm not going to stop making frames because I get a bad check. And so a couple guys came down from Whistler. They had heard about that I, I had set up shop, and one was, was Brent Martin. He's going to get mentioned quite a bit more, and Don Campbell. And they both wanted to order frames for me. So that was early June. I wrote down some numbers, what they wanted. So they were getting this new model that's called a Romax. And how the Romax came to be is that I woke up one night and I was having a dream and the Romax name was in my mind, on my mind. I woke up and there was a piece of paper beside my bedside. So I wrote down Romax. And when I woke up in the morning, I still liked that name. So that became a model name. So we had the Brody Romax. Romax doesn't mean anything, it's just a name. So anyway, I started building these, these two guys, Don and Brent, a frame each, and they started racing. You can, you can see, see me in my shop here. I'm, uh, I got my old welding goggles, don't use those anymore. And look, my hair is so dark. I was younger. So I built Brent his frame and he started racing and he started winning he just started winning right from the start. He's one of those guys who's, who's kind of a, 
a natural athlete. A lot of things he played rugby. He was very good at that, and he was at the moment he was building log cabins and training for a triathlon, so swimming, running. He just started winning. Well, there was one race that he didn't win anyway, and uh, and the race was all set to go, and he was off in the woods with his friends having a a safety meeting. Do you know what a safety meeting is? You uh, there's a herb involved, and they show up at the starting line, and everybody's gone. The race is left without him. So Brent puts the pedal down and he starts passing all these races and he ended up second after starting last. I don't know how many minutes behind the race. So anyway, that was that's just a part of his history. So I was building frames which were at the time fillet braids. We didn't have a TIG welder. So that's the kind of work which would come out of my shop. It was all fillet braids. We're using tangy tubing. Everybody's happy. So now what's going on is it's leading up to the big race of the year and it's called the Canadian, uh, a Canadian championship. <clears throat> it's not really the championship because like I mentioned earlier, Mountain bike racing came up from up from California and it spread up the coast up through Washington, Oregon. It got to Vancouver and the West Coast here, Whistler and the Cove, Mount Seymour. And so it was it was called a Canadian championship race, but it hadn't really gone east very much at all. Maybe a little bit, not much, but it's the championship race. That's what we all know it as. And you have to realize at this time that one of the most influential shops in Vancouver, the, in the Lower Mainland area, is the, te is the Deep Cove Bike Shop. And these guys were seriously hardcore. They, they use road, road bike cleats, shoes. They would clip in with the straps for riding off-road, and everybody just thought, wow, you guys are so hardcore. And so the Cove had, had some comments on these sloping top two frames that I was making because this was basically my first few months of being in production and there was still unsurety of, of my name. People hadn't heard of me. Even, even Brent, he took the decals off one side of the down tube and the decals off half the other side of the down tube. So one side said bro and the other side said die because he was a bit unsure of having the Brody name on his bike. And the Cove would say things like, well, it looks like a lady's bike, and how do you carry it? Because when they got to a hill, the bike went up on the shoulder with the horizontal top tube, and they sprinted up the hill, leapt on the bike, and down the hill. So they didn't know how you could carry it. Okay, so we're at the race now, and Brent is a little unsure. He's on the injured list. He's got a little bit of a cast on his, on his right wrist, and this is right before the race. You can see on the down tube, it only says, bro. He's having some problem with his chain, and there's his cast, and it's before the race. He can't find his gloves, so I had a set of gloves, which were basically brand new, so I said, Brent, use my gloves. And so he used them for the race. He won the race. So he became the Canadian championship. I got my gloves back. After one race, they were completely worn out with holes in them. That's, that's how hard he was riding on those, on, on, on those trails. And so he became the Canadian champion. He became the Canadian champion. So he was really instrumental in that sense of helping to launch the bike. Because after that, no one ever said, oh, it looks like a girl's bike or how do you carry it? The orders came in. So thank you, Brent, very much. And, and congratulations on winning the Canadian championship. When I was working for Rocky and I knew that I was leaving, I was always thinking about what kind of a Declan am I going to have on the down tube? And I put quite a bit of thought into it and I doodled and all that. And I came up with basically nothing. So I'm starting to build frames, but I don't, I don't have a decal. So one day I'm on Main Street, I'm just wandering in through little stores and there was the a very small store and they had a, a machine that could make decals 
and they only had four fonts. And I looked at the four fonts, and I knew right away that this was the font that I want. So <clears throat> I ordered a set of decals, and that's basically where the font has been ever since. It did get italicized a little bit more years and years later, but that font has always stayed the same for years and years and years. I like big brakes, and so even on a mountain bike, I like large brakes even on the front. So this is my Romax frame, and I was experimenting with a Bontrager fork. I got that on my bike, and I made a huge Mondo, Mondo U-brake. People were sort of split between a cantilever and a U-brake, and I favored the U-brake for a while anyway. So I milled this all out of solid, and it was big. And what happened was, when you put on the brake, it flexed these posts big time. You could actually see the post flex. So I knew that I needed some kind of a booster up here. So I was doing R&D on the brake, and this is how I came up with the product of the brake booster. Here's another shot of the brake, and you can see how the brake booster, it ties it all in. It gives enough clearance for the tires. Tires back then were 2.1. Look at my special brake hanger. I got two bolts and two nuts. I always thought that one bolt wasn't sufficient, even though I can't recall it ever. So I did a little bit of R&D on the brake hanger as well. You can see I've even got a grease nipple in here. These pads and the springs, they came from IRD Interlock Racing Design, Rod Moses. And this was the forerunner onto me going on and, and designing my own, own composite fork. Here's me on my, on my Romex. I'm actually racing in California at Mount Shasta. And last night when I looked closely here, I realized that I still got the cantilever brake on here. So all that R&D modification happened after this race. We did a video a while ago and I showed you how to make brake boosters manually. Most of the boosters we sold, they were all CNC machined, but this is kind of a nice shot of artiness in the shop. Here is the Gator Blade fork that I came up with. It's kind of hard to see in the shop, but it's an alloy crown. It's extruded out of 6061. Eight millimeter bolt holds the blade in from each side. Nobody else has done that before or since. Works really well. We never had a failure like that. This was the cantilever brake booster we made out of magnesium, had made out of magnesium. Those sold well. We sold thousands of those. So anyway, this is the Gator Blade Fork, and that was a name I came up with somehow. It's, it kind of sounds like the blade has some bite to it. In the shop, I was in charge of of making the gator blades this was my baby so this was a rack you can see how many forks got made at one time in total we made a total of 700 forks and we took them down to the <clears throat> interbike show in los angeles i believe and don't you know it the rock shock came out at exactly the same time we knew that we had a great fork but the buzz was rock shock. And well, we didn't sell as many forks as we want. We sold them at cost basically. And then years later, they became collector's items selling for 600 bucks. The most we ever sold them for was like 189. What a deal. Here's the AutoCAD drawing for those, for those of a, a technical mind here. I had Scott Taylor helping me out with the AutoCAD. We're still friends. After all these years, he, he did all the AutoCAD for a lot of the things we were we were working on at the time. I'd work in the daytime in the shop. I'd go around to his place after hours. These all got CNC machined. I tried making them manually, but CNC was much better. I like this page. It was the best innovations of 1989, and there we are, number 14. We didn't even have the name for the fork yet, so they just put it down as the Brody Composite Fork. Paul Brody, and uh, yeah, it was nice to get a mention in MBA. 
we've gone through, I've gone through a lot of how, how the build up was in the company and things like that. And so we got to a point, every company, it seems has their rise and fall. So at the top of our rise, we had uh, a dozen employees all at the same time. So man, I had my hands full trying to manage everything. The most frames we made in a year was 500. We had our own race team. In 1988, we moved to a larger location, more rent. We did four trade shows a year. We went to, we, we did ours in BC. We went to Toronto. We went to the States, either Las Vegas or Anaheim, and we went to Germany because Germany was quite an important market for us. In total, Brody Bikes has made 4,269 frames. So that's, I mean, it's not huge, but it's substantial. And all the time, you know, when I was working in the basement of the shop, in my house, me and my sister's house, I always had money in my pocket. And then as soon as we moved out to a commercial location and got the accountant, the lawyer, the bookkeeper, the advertising manager, all these layers of people and more sophisticated stuff, the two phone lines, the business phone line, the fax line and all this, we always had a hard time making money. And I think a lot of other bicycle frame building companies, even larger companies, they had troubles making money too. So anyway, we're not going to dwell on that. What I want to show you now is just some snapshots of what, what life was like back in those times. And then we're going to call it a wrap. This is outside our shop on, on Beckwith Street in Richmond. And this is, this is most of the gang. If you know us a little bit, you might recognize some faces in there. That's me at the very far left. At some point in time, we were making our thousandth frame and we decided that we wanted to make a bit of a splash with it. We were also in a lawsuit with a distributor. And so we just went ahead. We never asked, asked permission of them and we put a half page black and white ad in mountain bike action. Our distributor was not impressed. Notice that makes me smile. Here's our shop as this was in 1988 and because we were having a lawsuit and we weren't allowed to sell in North America, we decided that we would take on the German market and the, and the European market. So these boxes, I just about to fly to Germany for our first ever German trade show, which was a huge success. And you can basically see our shop, frames hanging up, frames being worked on. That was a good shop. And someone showed up in our office one day, I don't know who he was, and he handed this in and he had an idea for Brody Man, the cartoon series, and then I don't recall ever seeing him again, but I still have the front of the cover and uh, maybe someone else is gonna fly with it one day. No idea. We also did love handles. These were the handlebar extensions that went, went on either end of your handlebar and we had them in straight, had them in curved, anodized colors. They were popular for a while. I don't think anybody uses things like that anymore, but. Brody Love Handles. That was back in the day. Looks like the frames have come out of the paint booth, got their decals on them, waiting to get shipped out. That was one way we made money. I made a bike which became known as, as the Was Not. It was never really advertised much and it was a composite bike. It had an alloy 6061 front end. The back was a, a steel. We had a composite fork. So I know you were wondering where that big brake went. Well, it ended up on this bike. I built this brake. <clears throat> well, I built the brake, I built the bike, and then I, I never got it heat treated. And then once I built it all up and rode it around the park, and I thought, why did I ever build this bike? What am I going to do with it? I have no idea what I'm going to do with it. So right away, I went inside to the office and I phoned up the Mountain Bike Museum in California. And I said, I've got this bike. 
and I described it and they said, yeah, we'll, we'll take it. So it was, it was a gift. So it's got the brake booster, the big brake, a composite fork, which was not the Gator Blade, but that was another one of the prototypes that I made, made a series of prototypes. So there it is. It's got its decals on it. It's called the Was Not. If you look at the seat post, that was made by a local guy, Harvey Barton. The whole thing is made out of composite, so it's really light. You can't really, really alter the seat tube angle, but he made a bunch of those for a little while, and if you see that and you're wondering about it, that's a Harvey Barton invention, locally. I was married for a while, and, and my wife was into, in, in, into tie-dyeing. She made a lot of shirts and things for the company, and this was our banner. And it was hung up for a race, and it got stolen, never to be seen again. So... If you know where this, where this is and you'd like to return it, there is a reward. I'd like to have it back. That would be great. So you can contact me if you have it and want to give it back. I'll say 500 bucks. I used to do artwork from, from time to time. And so this is the artwork of, of the Brody Sovereign. And this would get used on t-shirts, coffee mugs, things like that. 1995, that's when that all happened. And the Sovereign was a high-end model, and we sold lots of them. I had a Sovereign for a few years. Great bike. Here's another batch of frames. It looks like a batch of 10, and it looks like the Canadian flag paint job. And if I had to say, this whole batch is going off to Germany because the Germans really love the Canadian insignia on the Sovereign frame, for example. So... Looks like one of our painters is hard at work. Sometime earlier on, a guy walked into our office. His name was Jim. He was an artist. He had a logo that he thought we might be able to use, and he wanted some bike parts. So the old barter system sprung into full, full force, and so this became the logo for our race. We did a race for annually. It was called the Brody Testa Medal. And then this logo got reused later for Brody Frame Building 101. So the logo became very handy. And we did that race, I don't know, six years in a row. And then it got so big, we had to hand it off to someone else. It just got to be, it was like a full-time job for a while. But a lot of fun. We used to run ads in, in, in mountain bike action. And I don't know if that was really effective way of using our money, but it was, it was Gary Ayton, who was one of our employees. There's his name, Gary Ayton, 91. And he would come up with these wild impressions of the mountain bike world. And he was really fast, too. Like, he could knock this, this whole thing. He didn't have to sit down and think about it and come out with an initial plan. This whole thing was maybe an hour. Maybe I'm exaggerating slightly, but it didn't take him long at all. He'd just whip it out and then, and then go back to work. Really good guy. So anyway, this is some of the stuff we sold, and we, we had a, a distributor in Germany, Switzerland, Japan, USA, Canada. So, wow, you could say worldwide. Maybe an exaggeration, but you could say that. As I mentioned previously, we had a race team, and this gentleman here, his name was Jojo Buscom. I would say he was our star rider, and uh, everybody liked him and he was fast, and it was good to have him on the team. Thanks, Joe. So when you do a slideshow and you show different things, it always comes back to kind of the main guy, and that's me holding a torch. Not today, a different time. Thank you very much for watching. We hope you've enjoyed that little look back into mountain bike history because it is that is mountain bike history, and that's sort of through the eyes of me who was up here playing an integral part in my own way in a small world of mountain bikes locally. So I'm sure you're going to have some questions and some comments. Maybe this is one of our longest videos. I don't know. I'm really thirsty right now. I'm thinking of coffee. Mitch and I like coffees. If you buy us coffees, wonderful. I'm still in chemo. I've passed my four months. I'm into five months. I'm doing well. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.